Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. The Family Feud, as most of you know, is a game show in which two families compete against each other in a competition to name the most popular responses to a survey question posed to 100 people. Since 2010, the show has been hosted by comedian and actor Steve Harvey. On one episode, Steve Harvey asked this survey question. When someone mentions the king, to whom might he or she be referring? The number one answer, with 81 giving this answer out of 100 people, was Elvis Presley. The contestant who uncovered the number two answer, that should have been number one to us, did so by saying, I'm going to go with the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, to which Steve Harvey nodded approvingly. Seven out of a hundred people in the survey gave that answer. The number three answer in the survey with three out of a hundred was Martin Luther King, Jr., and rounding out the list, the number four answer in the survey for someone mentioning who is the king was Burger King. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king of kings. The apostle Paul refers to Christ as the only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords in 1 Timothy 6.15. Within both of God's programs, for the earthly program with Israel in the heavenly program with the body of Christ. Christ is king and he is God and ruler over all. However, today under grace, Christ's office as the head of the church, the body of Christ, is primarily in view. Within Israel's program and her earthly kingdom hope, Israel was looking for the king and her Messiah who would establish a kingdom and rule from David's throne in Jerusalem, who would vanquish their enemies and bring peace to Israel and the world under his reign. And thus Christ's office within her program is primarily as Israel's king. And you, fi and you find in the account of Christ feeding the 5,000 that following that miracle, this is what Israel anticipated, and thus they tried to take our Lord by force and make him a king. The feeding of the 5,000 did demonstrate that Christ is Israel's Messiah and king, but it was not yet time for his kingdom. As Christ knew there were, could be no earthly kingdom of peace, righteousness, and joy for Israel without the payment for sin at the cross first. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 4 read, After these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. The feeding of the 5,000 was of such significance in Christ's earthly ministry that other than Christ's resurrection, it is the only miracle recorded in all four gospel records. At this time in Christ's ministry, there was a tidal wave of interest sweeping across the region of Galilee concerning him. Christ reaches the height of his popularity here. But after his discourse on the bread of life in this chapter, and when the people realized that his ministry was focused on spiritual needs, they began turning away from him and rejecting him. Thus, in first, verse 15 of this chapter, we read of the people's excitement about Christ and how they sought to make him a king by force. But then by verse 66 of this chapter, we read, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Christ demonstrated his power and his miracles to reveal his deity and his identity, that he is God and Israel's Messiah. And he did so so they would listen to and heed his words, 
which came from the Father. But the people came for the temporal miracles and not his eternal wor words. They were drawn by his miracles and sent away by his words because of their unbelief. While in Galilee, verse 1 teaches that Christ went over or across the Sea of Galilee. According to the other gospel records, Mark 6.35 says he went to a desert place. Luke adds that it was a desert place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Bethsaida was located on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And John 1.44 says, now Philip was of Bethsaida. And that comes into play here as we go along. Verse 2 says that a great number of people followed the Lord to this remote place. While Christ was going across the northern edge of the sea in a boat with his disciples, a massive crowd came out of the towns and villages and began gathering and walking along the northern shore following him. Matthew 14, 13 says, He departed thence by ship into a desert place apart, and when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Verse 2 here in John tells us what drew the people. The crowd followed him because of the miracles of the healings of the sick and the diseased, which they saw with their own eyes. The other Gospels tell us that the Lord and the disciples had just completed an extensive preaching tour that had left the disciples exhausted. Christ and the twelve had come here to try to withdraw and get away for a time of rest. The Lord told them at this time, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. So arriving in the wilderness around Bethsaida, the Lord with his disciples went right up into a mountain for a time of rest and refreshment. And John, importantly, dates the time of the miracle, that the Passover was just around the corner. So it was springtime and getting near to the time that they would have to go back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which was required of all Jewish males according to the law. John chapter 6, verses 5 to 9 read, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? When Christ was on the mountain, he looked out over the great multitude of people and observed the crowd. This great number of people hadn't all followed him out of belief that he was the Messiah, but more so out of curiosity and their desire to see more miracles. But in spite of their motivations for being there, Mark 6.34 says this, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. Christ looked at people in light of their needs, and he knew that what they needed the most was the Word of God. So he taught them. Moved with love and compassion, Christ taught God's Word to the multitude. And that teaches us to do the same, because God's Word is what people need most of all. In the teaching of the Word, is to be done with Christ's heart of love and compassion to help people understand it more clearly. The Lord looked at people in light of their needs, both spiritually and physically. He was well aware of their sufferings and the need of healing of many who followed him there. Matthew 14, 14 says that the Lord, Israel's Messiah, went forth and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. After traveling to this mountain, and then teaching the people, then healing their sick, 
According to Mark 6.35, the day was now far spent. It's at this point that the disciples came to the Lord and said in Matthew 14.15, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals or food. The hour was late. The disciples asked the Lord to send all the people away because they needed time before dark to get to some town or village where they could buy food and eat. But instead, the Lord turned to Philip and said here in verse 5, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? The disciples are telling the Lord to send them, send them away. Christ asked, Where can we go to get bread to feed them? Now again, Philip was from Bethsaida the nearby town, and he would have known where to find bread. If there was a Walmart nearby, he would have known about it. We have Piggly Wigglies in Wisconsin, but under the law, pork was unclean, so there was definitely no Piggly Wigglies in Israel. But Philip knew the area. He grew up just down the road, so that's why the Lord asked him. But verse 6 tells us that Christ was not really asking Philip to solve the problem, as Christ already knew what he was going to do. Rather, he was testing Philip's faith to refine and strengthen it. He had a lesson to teach Philip and the other disciples. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. God's Meaning in Matthew is a paperback 528-page commentary written by Pastor John Fredrickson. Finally, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the Gospel of Matthew written by a mid-Acts dispensational viewpoint. If you've ever been reading Matthew and asked yourself, what is the meaning of this? God's Meaning in Matthew is just what you've been looking for. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. In verse 7, Philip doesn't answer the question about where to get bread. He answered with how much. And he says it was simply out of range, financially speaking, for them to do or consider such a thing. Philip does a quick assessment of what it might cost for each one to just have a bite or two of bread. He says 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. A penny worth was a denarius. The denarius was a Roman coin, and one denarius was the wage of one day's work for a soldier or common worker. In the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, the Lord told about a landowner who made an agreement with the laborers for a penny, or a denarius, a day. So, doing the math with a worker working six days a week in that time, 200 denarii was the wages for a little over 33 weeks, or about eight months' wages. Philip looked at the crowd and told the Lord it would cost a fortune that they would need the equivalent of 200 days wages, and even that would only be enough for people to take a little and not provide enough to satisfy, to satisfy the hunger of all the men, women, and children. Philip looked at the problem in terms of meeting the minimum requirement. If a little for each person was impossible, then having more than enough wasn't even worth considering. But God is a God of abundance, and He meets needs abundantly, as we see here. Philip's answer showed that he failed the test that the Lord gave him. It would have been a different story if Philip had said, Lord, what are you, 
Why are you asking me? You made everything. Without you was not anything made that was made. You're Lord, you're creator. If you can do all these miracles, surely you can make dinner for everybody and give them more than enough. If he had said that, he would have passed the test by putting his trust in the power which he had seen displayed time and again, day after day, in the Lord's earthly ministry. But he first thought of and looked at only the practicality of it all, and he saw only the things he could control, and he saw just the mathematics of it all. It's been said that Philip was a matter-of-fact person, a quick reckoner and a good man of business, and therefore more ready to rely on his own shrewd calculations than on unseen resources. Like Philip, we too often fail the test when the Lord just wants us to trust him. Next, according to Mark 6.38, the Lord told the disciples to go into the crowd and search to see what might be available for food among them. After doing so, we find here in John 6, Andrew, Peter's brother, tells the Lord that all they could find was a lad, or a young boy, who was willing to share his five barley loaves and two small fishes. The barley loaves would have been leavened a little, formed into little disks about four or five inches in diameter, then baked. The small fishes were small seasoned sardine-like fish included for the sake of flavor. Barley was cheaper than wheat, and these barley loaves or small flat barley cakes were generally food for the poor. Yet this boy willingly gave his, his food and all of it sacrificially. Andrew recognized that obviously this was not enough to go around. But what are they among so many, he says. But in the hands of God, Andrew was about to find out that this was more than enough. John 6, verses 10 to 15 reads, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. The Lord had the disciples where he wanted them. Recognizing their own insufficiency and inability, their recognition of an impossible situation, and their need to depend on him. Christ then takes control, and he goes about his work in an orderly way. The disciples told the Lord, send them away. Christ told them, have them sit down. It's time to eat. There was a large grassy area, and he has everyone sit down and recline in the grass in order to stabilize the crowd and, and so that there'd be no rush for the food. Having them sit was a symbol of rest and points to the rest of the Christ millennial kingdom. And in the kingdom, Christ will provide for the people and their needs. That will be a time when the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And those at that time will be made to lie down in green pastures, as Psalm 23 states and as we see here. John records that the number of men present were about 5,000. That's only the men, not including the women and the children. And it is estimated that there could have been as many as 20,000 people total present. In Matthew's account, he referred to the women and children. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men, beside women and children. And so of all the miracles that Christ ever did, this is the most massive miracle in sheer number at one time. 
After the people were organized, Christ took those five small baked barley loaves in his hands and he gave thanks. Matthew 14, 19 says he prayed looking up to heaven, blessing the food, giving thanks to his father for the meal that they were all about to eat. And then with no fanfare, no voice from heaven, no lightning, no thunder, he gave the loaves and the fishes to the disciples and they suddenly became waiters and servers and carried the loaves and fishes and distributed the miraculous work of Christ to the crowd. And one lunch became two, then three, then again and again and again. And he kept handing the loaves and kept handing the fishes to the disciples over and over again. And talk about a supersized meal. This was it. How the miraculous multiplication of the food took place, we're not told. But Christ did not create a mound of loaves and fishes. It just says he handed the loaves and handed the fishes to the disciples, and then they gave it to the people seated in the grass. The miracle likely just took place in his hands, and there was just a continual creation of more loaves and more fishes, enough to feed more than 20,000 people. This is a staggering testimony to the identity of Jesus Christ as God and Creator. He kept passing out loaves and fishes because He kept creating it. And then you think about fresh bread and fresh fish. This was as fresh, fresh as it gets. And eating a perfect meal can lend itself to causing a person to eat a lot. And all did that day. It was an all-you-can-eat meal. And each person received more than a little, as Philip had said. They all received and ate as much as they would, as much as they wanted. And a lunch pail offering became a banquet feast in the hands of God the God of abundance, generosity, and the God of all grace. And all the people were filled or happily full and satisfied. There was no one left thinking, you know, another piece of bread would have been nice, or I could eat one more fish. After all ate and were satisfied, Christ then instructed the disciples to go gather up the leftovers. The leftovers speak to us that the crowd ate all that they wanted to eat. The Lord wanted the fragments gathered up among the crowd that were not eaten so that nothing was lost. There was to be no waste of the surplus. And the 12 disciples filled 12 baskets full of the uneaten fishes and loaves. In verse 14, realizing that a miracle had taken place, excitement grows among the people. And they make the connection between Christ and that prophet that should come into the world, which Moses had prophesied about. In Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. So their thought process was, wait a second. Moses was with Israel in the wilderness. Christ and we are in the wilderness. Moses had fed the people with miracle bread in the wilderness. Christ just fed the people with miracle bread in the wilderness. Passover is when Moses had led the people out of bondage in Egypt. Passover is right around the corner. Perhaps Christ was the one to lead the people out of bondage of the Romans at that time. And they were right. He was that prophet that Moses spoke of. The excited and satisfied crowd then began to stir as they wanted to coronate and make him king by force if necessary. But Christ, who is all-knowing and knew all men and what is in man, knew of the movement to make him king in light of his healings and feeding them. But he knew the people had felt prompted by their stomachs rather than their hearts. And Christ's kingdom was not of this world it was to be given to him by the Father. There could be no kingdom without the cross first. Interestingly, just prior to the Lord's first Passover in his earthly ministry, 
he turned the water into wine. Here, just before another Passover, he multiplied the bread. At his last Passover, Christ instituted a remembrance of the cross with these same elements, wine and bread. The twelve baskets collected were a witness to the abundance of the provision. Christ more than met their physical need of hunger. And this was a witness to how Christ can more than meet our spiritual need of our sin debt and the penalty of our sins by His perfect payment for our sins at the cross. And Christ showed through the gathering of the leftovers also that God's blessings in our lives should not be wasted. And so the blessings of marriage, family, money, time, health, opportunity should never be wasted and should be used for the Lord. And we should not overlook how the Lord used that young man's offering, though it was little. That little lunch from that young man meant so much to our Lord, and he used it greatly to meet the needs of others. And it shows how Christ uses anyone of any age. It's been said well that it's never about how much we have to offer, but rather if we will offer whatever we have. Jesus had the power to create food out of thin air or from the rocks on the hillside, but he chose to work with a small gift from a little boy. Sometimes the greatest miracle happens when we let go of some little possession and put it into God's hands. What God does with what we give him becomes secondary to the delight of participating in his work in the world. Like that young boy, we are called to give what we have. With our gifts of time, our talents, our resources, God wants us to give willingly and sacrificially of these things to him. We might wonder, what difference would I make if I give these things to the Lord? But God multiplies the little things that we have and give and that we do for Him, and He uses them for His purposes and glory. The things we have to give to the Lord may be like a young child's small lunch offering, but they can be used miraculously in the hands of God. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.